Time at four o'clock, so we'll call the meeting to order. Roll call, please. Eva Henry, Jan Pulaski, Bill Holland, Nancy Sharp, Elise Jones, Here. David Beacom, Here. Tim Mock, Chrissy Fanganello, Anthony Graves, Anthony. Robin Kneech. <laughs> Dimper is not paying attention. Roger Partridge, Gail Watson, Don Rozier, Libby Zabo, Bob Pfeiffer, Here. Bob Roth, Here. Larry Vidham, David Spellman, Aaron Brockett, Matt Applebaum, like Ann Justin, Lynn Baca, Rex Bell, George Teal, yes. Doris Trular, Carrie Penaloza, Ron Engels, Catherine Hyder, Laura Christman, Richard Champion, Greg Gail Christie, Rick Teeter, Here. Debbie Nasta, Steve Conklin, Here. Joe Jefferson, Here. Jeff Deacon, Daniel Dick, Here. Lisa Jones, Laura Brown, Lynette Kelsey, Henry Ergot, Scott Norquist, Storm Glore. I'm Storm, Storm Glore here. Thank you. So Shakira's Graves, Casey Brown. Ron here. K, uh, Ron Rakowski. Brad Weasley, Stephanie Walton, Shakti, Dana Gutwine. Here. Jerry Bean, Phil Sernanik. Present. Jackie Millay. John Peck, Dave Santos, Ashley Stolzman. Connie Sullivan, Dan Greenberg, Colleen Whitlow, Joyce Palazuski, Deborah Jerome, Sean Foray, Chris Larson, Kyle Mullica, Jordan Sowers, John Dyack, Sally Daigle, Gary Howard, Rita Dozal, Adam Mikowski, Herb Atchison, Joyce J, Adam Zarin, Deborah Perkins Smith, Bill Van Meter. Very good, thank you. <clears throat> Under attachment A is the summary of the July 6, 2016 board work session. Uh, unless there are changes or additions, we'll accept it as it is. Agenda item for public comment. We do request that there be no public comment uh, for which there's been a prior public hearing before this board. Is there anyone that wishes to address this body this evening? See nobody. We'll move on to agenda item five, review of the Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan Attachment B. Mr. Rieger. So, Chair, Directors, thank you very much. Uh, Jacob Rieger, Transportation Planning Manager, Dr. Cog. Uh, so this is the beginning of a few conversations that we're going to have about the Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan, um, and I'm going to talk about both this plan and its relationship to MetroVision. So I try not to use acronyms in my presentation, but um, I will ask your forbearance to say MVRTP the rest of the evening today, because if I say MetroVision and MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan, it's gonna be a long day for all of us. <laughs> so having said that, um, you all and we all have been working hard on MetroVision uh, over the last several uh, months. Um, as you know, it's out for public, uh, public review and comment. Um, as you well know, because you all have contributed your blood, sweat, and tears, um, it has our strategic planning framework uh, within MetroVision, our outcomes, our objectives, our strategic initiatives, our performance measures, and our 2040 targets. And all of that strategic planning framework is organized around several themes, including transportation. So as you know, there is a transportation theme within the draft MetroVision plan. Um, so I'm gonna talk about you know, going forward with that. In our 2040 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan, which I'm going to you know, talk about what that is and what, what we do with it, but the point here on this slide is that we are going to directly incorporate, directly include the transportation theme from MetroVision, you know, once it's finalized, um, into our 2040 MVRTP. So I want to make that point that it's going to integrate very directly because we are literally going to replicate it and include it uh, within the MVRTP. 
So this is the uh, this is the hardest slide in the presentation. So if we get through this slide, the rest of it's smooth sailing. Uh, this is a little complex. This is where we talk about sort of extracting things and then integrating things back together. So let me walk you through this. Back in 2011, uh, the board at that time adopted both the 2035 Metro Vision and the or Metro Vision 2035, I should say, and the 2035. And BRTP. We adopted those together. Um, they were linked together, and we went forward with both of those plans together. We have a federal requirement, and we have many federal requirements on the transportation side that I'll show you in just a minute. But one of those federal requirements is that we have a long range transportation plan um, to the feds every four years. So when we adopted the MVRTP in 2011, we needed to give something to the feds again in early 2015. Well, in early 2015, we were all collectively still working on MetroVision, but we had this transportation deadline with the feds. You know, we needed to meet that, meet that deadline. So what we did is we adopted, this is the middle piece here in the slide, what we called the 2040 fiscally constrained regional transportation plan. So this was sort of extracting out of our larger MVRTP. It was extracting out, you know, kind of the most critical piece of meeting those federal requirements in terms of identifying and prioritizing multimodal projects, programs, services, things that we could find, uh, the revenues that we thought we'd have available to fund those things uh, through 2040, and kind of a summary of lots of other information that uh, typically resides within the MVRTP. So it was, it was sort of that summary critical piece that we needed to adopt and get to the feds in 2015, and the board adopted that in February 2015. So we took it apart. Now we're going to put it all back together. Now we're going to create the 2040 MVRTP. Um, we are planning for uh, adoption, tentative, tentative plan for adoption early next year, uh, so kind of on the heels of, of the MetroVision plan. We're going to put it all back together where it's going to, the 2040 MVRTP is going to incorporate um, both the MetroVision plan, as I've said, uh, the 2040 fiscally constrained regional transportation plan that we have. Uh, we've had amendments in the last couple years to the transportation plan, so we'll obviously incorporate those. And we're going to put all those pieces back together and once again have a whole, you know, sort of complete document, a complete transportation plan of the 2040 MBRTP. So usually I'd wait to, to take questions, but just on that point, um, I want to ask if there's any questions before we go forward, because I know it's confusing. It's a lot of process and timelines, but does that sort of in general terms make sense? Director Partridge with no name tag. <laughs> I wasn't sure who you were, but. I didn't. Well, good. I can ask a stupid question then. Don't tell Josh I said that. Wow. That was great. This is I, a tough room. Jake, no specific questions that you have there, but I always ask the question, you know, you, and, it, and I looked this up. I, I didn't know this, everybody, but Zagger and Evans had the song in the year 2525. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jake, can you explain to us why we're looking at 2040? Yes. I have some understanding, but I think you have a better explanation of that. Why 2040? Why do we not look at 2020 plan? Our public says you're way, way in advance. So the short answer is the feds make us, and that's the truth. But um, sort of the more eloquent answer is because, you know, what people don't realize in transportation plans from the time of sort of what we call uh, planning to pavement or conception to, you know, whatever, um, the time that you first think about a transportation project and you go through all the steps, you know, whether it's, you know, getting in a plan, acquiring right away, doing the engineering and the design, you know, collecting funds for construction, you know, all of that, it can actually take a really long time. I mean, look at fast tracks, how hard the regions worked on fast tracks and how long, um, you know, that's taken even to get the lines that we have today. So we do really need to look in the future. There are other documents and other processes where we do look sort of shorter term like the TIP, but the feds do require us to have at least a 20-year long-range transportation plan where we are sort of forcing ourselves to look really out in the future and start planning way ahead so we can work towards those things. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. okay. Other questions? Who just joined us on the phone? Laura Brown. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead. All right. So speaking uh, specifically about now the 2040 MBRTP, um, what this slide shows is kind of the major sort of topic areas of the plan, and I'm going to go through each of these in just a little bit of detail, but sort of at the highest level, um, this plan is several things. It talks about federal requirements, uh, talks about our planning assumptions, you know, land use, growth, jobs, those sorts of things. 
Um, as I hope I've already emphasized, the integration with MetroVision uh, and the strategic planning framework within MetroVision for transportation. Um, we talk about our multimodal transportation system in this region, not just the things that we build, but you know, operating the system, maintaining the system, um, the programs, our way to go program, you know, things that your communities are doing at the local level. Um, you know, it's a whole collection of, of things in that basket that together is our multimodal transportation system, and we walk through each of those and profile those uh, within the plan. Um, again, as I've said, we have our fiscally constrained uh, piece, our fiscally constrained regional transportation plan, which is that sort of federal requirement of what projects are we going to fund, projects, programs, services, operation, maintenance, safety, transit, bike ped, all of it. What are we going to fund through 2040? What revenues are we going to use uh, to fund those projects, programs, and services? And then the feds also ask us to look at or, you know, guide us to look at. Um, so, all right, we've got this transportation plan. We're looking out to 2040. We've got our projects and services. You know, what are the benefits and the impacts of the transportation plan? Uh, so what does that mean in terms of things like environmental justice or how the system will perform once we get to 2040? Uh, what about environmental mitigation? So those sort of topics we address in the plan as well. So fundamentally, this plan is a combination of um, you know, sort of data, projects, funding, prioritization, strategic planning framework, narrative, explanation, education, and information. It's, it's all of those things. So just to kind of uh, briefly go through uh, each of those high-level things, you know, introduction is obviously what it sounds like, plan, purpose, and relationships, uh, federal requirements. You know, particularly here we talk about our public engagement process, and it's not just for the transportation plan. You know, um, you've heard Brad say this, you've heard others say this, you know, we try and approach things in a integrated and holistic way. So everything we've been doing the last several years, all of us together, all of you, uh, at Dr. Cog, the last several years, whether it's the, the um, Sustainable Communities Initiative, whether it's MetroVision, whether it's the TIP, you know, we've had that sort of public process, we've had that dialogue with all of you in your communities, and we try and reflect, uh, in this case, those transportation things within the transportation plan. Uh, this is the pinwheel of federal requirements, uh, so to speak, and there are more than these. Um, but, you know, bottom line here is there are, frankly, a lot of federal requirements, and I don't say that in a negative way. We would, we would probably want to do most or all of these things anyway, but there are many things that the feds do both require uh, and guide us to do in the transportation plan. Obvious things like public involvement, uh, environmental justice, which is looking at low-income and minority communities, the benefits and the impact of the plan uh, on those communities. Um, things within the FAST Act that we have to look at. Uh, you've all heard a little bit about our performance-based planning process that the feds require. You know, all of those things we have to uh, speak to and address in the transportation plan. Uh, the two sort of biggest kind of fundamental things that we always have to concern ourselves with um, is this concept of fiscal constraint, which again is that project costs and, and expenditures, you know, on the entire transportation system, projects and you know, operating, maintaining, all of those things, all the expenditures that we're going to have on transportation, uh, balance with the revenues that we expect to have available through 2040 uh, to fund those expenditures. That's fiscal constraint. Can we afford what's in the plan? That is a core federal requirement. Air quality conformity uh, is also a core federal requirement that we have to show that the plan itself and when we amend the plan, that the plan as amended meets air quality conformity requirements for several criteria pollutants. Um, in the plan, we talk about transportation challenges and planning assumptions. So again, these are things like data. Um, what are the what are the sort of underlying assumptions that we're using to create this plan? You know, what is our um, what is our population employment forecast through 2040? Uh, what are some of the issues out there that we're trying to address? Whether it's the um, you know aging of our population that you've all heard so much about, whether it's technology and autonomous vehicles. Um, you know, whether it's uh, first and last mile connections, you know, all those sort of issues and challenges, uh, data and things that, you know, that we want to address that sort of underpin this plan uh, we talk about. Um, I said that we profile each of the uh, components and the elements of our multimodal transportation system. Uh, this kind of shows it graphically, and again, I've made the point. It's not just the projects we build. We all care about that, the big highway and the interchange and the fast tracks projects that collectively the region builds, but it's how we operate. Uh, and maintain these things. It's ITS. It's um, our way to go program, as I've said, uh, technology, 
you know, again, autonomous vehicles, connected vehicles, those sorts of things, you know, trip planning apps in your, in your palm of your hand, in your phone. Um, it's safety. It's the security of the transportation system. Um, it's freight. It's aviation. It's all these sort of specialized topics. Um, again, we address all of these, at least speak to all of these in the transportation plan. Can we ask real quick, who, yes, who just joined us on the phone, please? Sorry, it's Laura Brown again. Thank you. Um, again, I've mentioned the fiscally constrained piece of the plan. So um, you all uh, adopted this in February of 2015. Um, so this we're carrying forward, and this we'll do every four years where we kind of update uh, sort of revenue projections. We do this cooperatively with CDOT and RTD uh, and other financial stakeholders. And then we look at uh, the projects that we're funding in the plan and, pro and again, projects, programs, services, expenditures for our transportation system across the region and look at, you know, how those balance. So we did that back in 2013, 2014 uh, to adopt in 2015. Uh, we're actually going to start that process again in the next year or two uh, leading up to our next four-year cycle uh, in 2019. Um, I said that the feds direct us to look at the benefits and the impacts of our fiscally constrained regional transportation plan. So we, you know, we fund these projects and programs and services. What happens when we do that? How does the transportation system perform? You know, what number of person trips do we have? What transit boardings do we have? Um, you know, what are vehicle speeds on the network? You know, all those sorts of data things. Uh, we look at those. Uh, we look at things like energy consumption, greenhouse gas emissions. This is where we can tie back to the MetroVision um, MetroVision performance measures and targets because we have, as you well know, because you put so much hard work into it, we have targets around things like uh, vehicle miles of travel, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, non-single occupant vehicle mode share to work. You know, so can we, can we start to get towards those uh, performance measures and targets through the transportation plan uh, that we're funding? Uh, I mentioned environmental justice, how this plan sort of lands on uh, folks uh, who are minorities or have low income. Uh, the feds ask us to look at that and to make sure that both the benefits and the impacts of the transportation plan um, are proportional. So it's not like back in the 50s where we're plowing interstate highways through poor communities that, you know, yes, we've got projects all over the region, but are there, is there kind of a balance of benefits and impacts with those projects? Um, at a regional level, we're looking at environmental mitigation. Um, and then as individual projects go forward, they have a lot to do at the project level. And then, as I've mentioned, air quality conformity. So there's a lot in here. Um, in the transportation plan, and I just want to sort of give you that overview. Um, in kind of particular, I said this is the initial conversation that we're going to have with you. Today I'm going to talk about what we call the tr uh, coordinated transit plan, uh, but there's, you know, so sort of several sort of thematic things uh, that we'll have future conversations with you about. In particular, besides transit, uh, we're going to look at what we call active transportation, which is walking, bicycling, sort of anything non-motorized. Uh, freight and goods movement is a big federal and state emphasis. We've been doing work on that, as has CDOT and others. Uh, so we'll talk about that in a future meeting as well. So I'm going to highlight transit today, but before I uh, start in on the transit piece, any, any questions so far? Director Cernanek. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Jacob, um, I, I know there's a slide in here later that talks about our, our partners, but as you go through this, um, I, are you going to get to the engagement with our partners, not just engagement with the public? Uh, and uh, what has been uh, their review or comment uh, as it moves forward with the various drafts? Um, I don't have a slide on that particular topic, but I can tell you um, I can tell you verbally now, and I can also include that in the next conversation that we have. But um, in a nutshell, when we adopted the fiscally constrained RTP back in 2015, we had a lot of engagement both with the public and with our planning partners. The feds require us to have what they call a 3C planning process, continuing, continuing comprehensive and coordinated. I think that's right. Um, and uh, we, you know, with our partners and with the public. So when I say partners, you know, specifically CDOT, RTD, Regional Air Quality Council, uh, many other sort of those level of stakeholders, um, other organizations, particularly on sort of these thematic things like on freight, we've been working with the State Freight Advisory Council. Um, as you've noted, when we get to transit here in a minute, I'll talk to you about who we've been working with on transit. But short answer is yes, we've been working with a lot of uh, stakeholders, partners, and the public. Um, sort of the first round when we adopted the fiscally constrained RTP, um, the work that you all have been doing with MetroVision and with SCI, 
um, and now as we go forward, uh, putting all these pieces back together. Go ahead. And a, a follow-up on that, as um, we look at regional air quality, and since the Quality Council is in included with this, um, some of our particulates and such uh, come from traffic uh, and transportation, but also a fair amount uh, comes from transport. I'm not talking about freight in this instance. I'm talking about transport from elsewhere that gets to dump itself into the bowl of our Denver metro region. Um, how do you, is, is there anything in here that isolates when we start looking at air quality, isolates transport and what might happen with that versus what's locally generated? So I'll answer that a couple ways and then I'll uh, phone a friend in the back there. But short answer is that we are responsible in this process for looking at mobile source emissions. So, you know, things from a tailpipe, let's say. So in other words, we are not looking at power plants, we're not looking at oil and gas, we're not looking at some of the other things, you know, that can be contributors to uh, pollution. In the issue of things sort of coming, you know, pollution that's generated here versus that sort of floats over here from outside the area, you know, we call that background pollution. That admittedly has been a struggle. I think it's two-thirds uh, of our total ozone is, is background ozone. Um, so it is something that, that we have to try and sort of struggle with, um, but that is part of the equation. Uh, Steve, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Other than, other than it's, you know, those of you that are familiar with and serve on the Regional Air Quality Council, it's their state implementation plan, which really is the, the plan and document that brings all those other things in, all the other sources, and calls out specifically the mobile source transportation uh, <laughs> aspect, which is what we deal with specifically in our air quality conformity documents. I'll, I'll follow on one more. Is, um, you know, recognizing that the, the key in getting to a 2040 plan is going to be somewhat in the assumptions uh, and where the data is, um, what's a good source to say, you know, what's anticipated with regard uh, alternate fuel vehicles and what that might do in their adoption uh, that at least some folks say, you know, we may be getting close to hitting a tipping point as to where some of that may go. So without um, boring you with too much detail, the feds require that in the plan between now and 2040, we have what we call air quality staging periods. These are interim periods between now and 2040 in which we need to do that air quality conformity analysis, and we have four of them, 15, 2015, 2025, 35, and 2040. When we do that work, and we actually we do a third-party sort of sourcing out of that work, we, we model it, it's sort of using our traffic model here at Dr. Cog, and then the outputs from the traffic model we give to the State Air Pollution Control Division. They actually do the air quality analysis using an EPA software called MOVES. In the MOVES software, it has assumptions about things like uh, fleet mix, alternative vehicles, you know, things that are going on in the future that, um, that we have to sort of conform to that's used in the analysis and is part of, part of the analysis and part of the results in terms of what will happen in those stage years. Let's see, I don't know if you want to. Director Atchison. Yeah, just kind of going back to Phil's question in, in regards to air quality. Uh, I know that Elise, Jackie, and Shock T from Dr. Cog all sit on the rack. I sit from the governor's office on there. But the document that's dealing with that very issue you're talking about with transport and stuff is in the current document that was presented to air quality control is out for public comment and review right now. It'll be out for, Steve, what, another month? Uh, the hearing is November 17th. Yeah, so that's that addresses, I think, Phil, a lot of the questions you have, especially the issue that we are continuing to be a non-attainment area because of a high part of that being transport. And from Japan through the West Coast and into here is where a lot of that that they have tracked and is coming from. That We have no way to control but out of the attainment areas that we have, we only have about four stations, Jackie, between you and Lisa, I think it's four stations that we see regular violations of on, on that monitoring. And it's all right up next to the mountains where as it comes over, it just sits there and it's not moved out. We have to continue to address that as a metro area. And there's really, unless you can stop the winds, we will continue to stay out of it. Yep. Yeah. And well, the only other thing that you can potentially stop is all the cow poop in Wyoming. That was another piece that they're talking about, <laughs> methane coming from. But 
we will have a hard time continuing to meet the current ozone requirements and currently before Congress is a new set of requirements even more stringent on ozone than we have today. Uh, will, will, will they be helping us put uh, fans to kind of push it up as it goes over the mountains so it might no. float further east? <laughs> no, because we can't, we can't do that because then it would create a bigger ozone requirement of all the energy consumed to blow the wind. Solar power. Director Dozel. Uh, I have a question on the number of vehicle trips and the vehicle miles traveled. It was a previous slide, so I apologize for that. But we have a 38 percent increase in population in, 2020, in 2040, and we have a slightly less increase, smaller increase in vehicle trips and miles at 32 percent. So I'm wondering, and we have a huge increase in seniors. Uh, and n naturally, you would think that the more seniors we have, the fewer vehicle trips there will be. So is this reduction, I'm, I'm saying that, but, you know, so I'm asking this data. Not, I don't need it right now, but it just came to me. Do we show this smaller increase in vehicle trips and miles traveled based on the fact that we have more seniors that are traveling less or based on the fact that we're doing a better job with trans, transit? So uh, let me answer that this way. First of all, this table is you know, a couple of years old. This, this changes every time we run the model. These are outputs from the model. These are not inputs that we plug in. This is what the model tells us is happening in the future. So this is an example of it, but not the final numbers yet. Having said that, um, let, me, let me make a couple points just to be clear. This region by 2040 is going to add at least 1.2 million people and over half a million new jobs. We are going to grow significantly. You know, it's sort of like the size of Indianapolis. We're going to add Indianapolis to the Denver region by 2040. So absolute VMT, vehicle miles travel, is going to go up significantly by 2040. It's just, it's just going to, right? What we have been showing in a few model runs is that vehicle miles of travel per capita, so per person, may stay about the same, right? So even as VMT goes up, VMT per capita might be a little bit more level. It might go down a little slightly. It might go up a little slightly. Um, at least as of a couple of years ago in our model, it's kind of what we were showing. And I don't, I don't want to speculate too much as to why that may be um, because things, you know, things keep changing. Because I can tell you recently VMT and VMT per capita have started to go up again. So it's, it's kind of cyclical with the economy. It, it uh, depends on technology, you know, autonomous vehicles. Will that actually increase or, or decrease, you know, VMT? I mean, there's so, many, there's so many factors. But I do want to make the point that, yes, VMT is going to go up. Uh, what we, you know, we do look at that, but we also look at what can we do to at least try and hold the line on VMT per capita. Director Rakowski. Two quick points. Uh, one really goes to um, our rack folks, uh, given the Paris Accords having gone into effect yesterday, and I believe Japan is part of that, will that help? <coughs> That's something we can look forward to. And secondly, as to the comment about the imbalance, I think part of that might be something we don't like to talk about, and that is the demographics economically are changing, and fewer people will be able to buy cars because they can't afford them. And that's something that we've probably planned a little better for with uh, the fast track system as long as we can find the money to flesh it out with bus connections, which is the other issue that RTD faces. So I think those are two factors that play into uh, trying to prognosticate out to 2040. Director Atchison. Yeah, it kind of in line with what uh, Ron's talking about, too, but I think most of the transportation means that we go to around, we are not going to see a reduction in cars. What we are going to see is a huge increase in driverless cars. Those who are not able to drive will start to use that. Uh, it, it, you know, synonymous is jokingly, we're going to start to see those who use the cars to take their kids to school so they don't have to drive. But everything that most of your big transportation companies and stuff are gearing up for is a huge increase in the number of cars that are going to be manufactured over the next five years, looking at how are we going to legislatively deal with that because even under federal regs right now, you can't have a driverless car. Federal legislation, state legislation, all are going to have to change to recognize those are things that are coming to our society and our world and how are we going to deal with it. 
But because there's so much of that potential coming in, the actual the number of vehicles is going to go up. Partly in what Ron said, you may not be buying a car, but you can certainly be calling Uber and your drivers of the car every time you want to leave the house. Director Jones. Well, just, I mean, I think there's a lot of interesting things that will happen in our future between now and 2040 that may shift a lot of these numbers. And adding to what Herb said, um, one of those that could be a bit of a game changer with regards to vehicles is um, improving the emission technology, i.e. electrifying passenger vehicles. And w one of the things that we'll get a briefing on at the upcoming board meeting is the Volkswagen settlement. Um, there's, a, you know, over $60 million slated to potentially come to Colorado. And folks are talking about how to spend that, and one of the ways it might be spent on is is really um, uh, putting into place uh, EV charging stations up and down I-70 and I-25 and really uh, creating electric highway that connects us with neighboring states who are also doing a similar thing. That could really change how many people are uh, using electric vehicles in a, real, in a faster time frame than we anticipated. So there are some things out there that could help us with emissions, and, and that would be um, um, in concert with uh, Excel continuing to rely less on coal in their utility plans, is, which is what they're planning. So there's some hope there, I think, um, as we move forward to, to look at how we might decrease some of these emissions. Director Dozel. Another comment about the emissions. I know uh, I had sent this to you and to Jackie. I'm um, not Jackie, Jennifer, the other one. Yeah, yeah, no, you too. You should be involved in this. <laughs> yeah, and so the next gen uh, air traffic control, uh, yeah. that they're going to take out, and so we should put this in our plan and hold the federal government to this, that their next gen air traffic control using satellite and GPS rather than the uh, outmoded, um, who was the guy that did all the airplane maps? We'll, we'll be right. No, no, the guy <laughs> that our, uh, our airport is named after. Jefferson. Yeah, Jefferson. Jefferson, instead of using those maps and ground point mapping and stuff, they're using this. But the presentation is that they're going to take out, I think it was like 8 million or billion, I don't know, it's a huge amount of, of cubic, 8 million cubic tons of carbon because of changing the flight patterns and using this satellite-based transportation. So we, I suggested that we get them to come here and give us this presentation uh, so that they the, the FAA that's putting this in place, we can hold them accountable for removing, I think it's like 8 million tons of carbon from Denver's airspace in the next few years. It's not a huge number of years. Yes, Robin wants to say something. I thought you were doing hand signals, throwing signs, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. But, it, it, you know, that is a huge, if they can actually, they say they can do it. But we should hear that presentation and see how we want to incorporate it into, back to them, the, federal, the other department that says we have to get the emissions down. Because we're getting a lot of it from the airplanes that are flying into DIA. So staff has made a note to reach out and see if we can't have that happen? Mr. Eager. Sure. Thank you. And, and just to put a capstone on this, you all are right. How's that for a positive affirmation? The, the world is changing rapidly, and, and we try and reflect that the best we can in the transportation plan, and all of our plans for that matter. You've had the same conversation, MetroVision. Uh, we do update these plans frequently. We do try and, you know, keep our uh, fingers on the pulse of, you know, technology and mobility and trends that are these global trends that, that are affecting us, things that we don't even know. You know, the iPhone is not quite 10 years old. It didn't exist 10 years ago. Uber and Lyft didn't exist five years ago. So the world keeps changing, and we do try to keep up with that uh, through the work that all of us do at Dr. Cog and specifically uh, in our MVRTP. So let me pull out uh, sort of one of these thematic uh, themes to give you an introduction. Uh, let's talk about transit a little bit. Uh, specifically, as I said, what's called the Coordinated Transit Plan. Um, it actually has a, a longer acronym that I'll see if I can get right from memory. It's the Coordinated Public Transit Human Service Transportation Plan. Um, and it's, uh, that comes straight from the Federal Transit Administration. Uh, it's a requirement that FTA has uh, upon us. 
Uh, specifically, it's a requirement for one of the FTA funding programs uh, known as 5310 that you see in the bottom of the slide that deals with transportation for um, older adults and individuals with disabilities. The feds require that we have a transit plan so that when those grant dollars are being allocated and projects are being selected, they're actually being selected against the transit plan knowing that uh, the projects that are being funded support sort of the goals and the direction of this coordinated transit plan. So this is one of many important pieces of the larger transportation plan. So fundamentally, it is the transit section of the MVRTP. Uh, it deals with you know, the things that we think about of transit, which is buses and trains, um, but it also deals with what we call human service transportation, uh, the accessor ride, um, the call and ride, um, you know, volunteer driver programs, all those sorts of things that, um, that we don't necessarily think about and frankly don't get enough attention in the world. Uh, they really should. So this is a holistic uh, and integrated look at all flavors of transit. And it's a document that this time we're integrating directly within the larger uh, MVRTP document. Uh, the last time we did this back about 2010, 2011, uh, we had a standalone transit element, you know, really good piece of work that my predecessors did, uh, but it kind of floated out there as its own thing. And this time we want to integrate it and fuse it directly within the larger MVRTP. Um, as I said, it is the federally required coordinated plan, uh, specific content requirements that I'll touch on here in a second. Uh, and as I said, it is used to verify eligibility of projects uh, that are funded through the FTA 5310 program. And that's true across the country, both here and, and across the country. Uh, the major topics that FTA asks us to address in the transit plan, public and stakeholder input, uh, so to, to Director Cernanik's question uh, earlier, uh, existing services and funding, demographics and forecasted growth, so a little bit like our larger transportation plan, what are the data and the trends uh, kind of telling us, you know, what's happening with transit, what's happening with growth, what's happening with the needs, what will the future needs, uh, needs assessment for transit be over time, and then what strategies might we come up with to start addressing those needs. So public and stakeholder input, you know, sort of the most important thing that we do on, on any of our work here. Um, specifically in the transit realm, in the coordinated transit plan, we do have some specific and important stakeholders. Uh, we have what's known as the uh, Dr. Mack, the Denver Regional Mobility and Access Council, um, a sister agency to Dr. Cog, that's why the name's even similar. Um, they focus on information education um, around human service transportation, helping people connect to the services that are out there. Uh, in terms of, you know, if I'm a veteran who lives in Adams County and I need to go somewhere on a Tuesday afternoon, uh, you know, what are my options? You know, those sorts of things. So very, very important organization um, and kind of our regional coordinating council in terms of bringing human service transportation interests together. Um, so very important forum for us where we serve on their board. Um, our transit planner, Matthew, serves on their board, uh, and we have worked with hand-in-hand -in -hand with them on this transit plan. Uh, Community-based organizations, of which there's many, um, RTD and CDOT, obviously, uh, general public, obviously, and even FTA itself. We're working with FTA right now to kind of show them the draft plan, kind of walk them through it. Director Sernanik. Yes, Jacob. Um, as you're uh, talking about stakeholders, one that's not mentioned that's part of our uh, discussion around mobility choice uh, is taking a look at the private employer group represented by the chamber and such. And uh, I know in my discussion with a number of local employers, uh, folks have gone to elongated four days a week uh, and uh, alternate closing times to deal with congestion. Um, and, uh, you know, to what extent are you um, looking at potential um, uh, crux points uh, relative to those trends uh, that might move us past the tipping point uh, because I know that some of our communities are moving towards higher speed um, home access and even some of our communities are looking at commercial lines into residential so that folks can work from home. Yeah, um, short answer there is that in general terms, yes, we are looking at that. We look, we look at that sort of in general through our Way to Go program and other sort of agency-wide and region-wide things that we do. Um, in the particular case of our transit plan, um, part of what we're doing here is sort of leveraging the work of others. Uh, we can't do this all ourselves. It's not feasible for us to do, do this all ourselves. But, you know, RTD, some of our community-based organizations, our county-based local coordinating councils, you know, other folks that are closer to the ground wrestling with those issues, we have heard from them and are trying to address that input in the larger transit plan. So uh, those, you know, those concerns are, are absolutely understood. And recognizing that, Jacob, you may want to make sure that the document reflects 
uh, that private employers are part of the stakeholder group and we're looking at that side as well as uh, technology providers that are, are putting yep. fiber in places that uh, and capacity for that fiber. So I'm staring at our transit planner to know that we will do that. Thank you. Director Graves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, let me say the Director Smanic actually read my mind. It's a little bit scary here as we approach Halloween. Because you're doo -doo -doo -doo. So close together. <laughs> I'm never sitting here again. I, I do have a question about whether or not there's also a, a connection or tracking of records of decision for other major projects. So I've started recently serving on the I-70 collaborative effort that's really sort of monitoring the, the record of decision around I-70 and looking at future solutions for congestion there. And I, I think that there are a number of points of connection that are possible in the future as that gets unraveled. So I'm wondering if Dr. Cog is monitoring that sort of effort and if there are any points of connection. Um, in general sense, yes, we do. Uh, we don't do it specifically in this document, but through our transportation planning process in general, yes, we do. And when things bubble up from those sort of project-based or project-level things, you know, that are appropriate or germane to a specific thing like this, we do try and incorporate those. Mr. Eager. Is there a question on the phone? Did somebody on the phone have a question? I didn't. Okay. Mr. Eager. Okay. Um, so sort of continuing on with what's in the transit plan, um, existing services profile, which is, you know, what it sounds like it is. And again, we're looking at both um, what we call fixed route or local bus service, uh, rapid transit like fast tracks, um, but we're also looking at human service transportation. So as an example here, um, and I've listed them here on the, on the slide. Seniors Resource Center and VM Mobility are two of our biggest human service transportation providers. You may not know them directly, but they operate in your communities. Uh, they help people who have no other options uh, for transportation, whether it's connecting them to other forms of transportation or directly taking them um, to their, you know, to their destinations. You know, very important, critical, sort of below the radar, um, don't get as much visibility as they should, but um, you'd be surprised how much sort of human service transportation um, how important that is and how much that's sort of out there. And that's something that um, our transportation division works on. Um, I'm staring at JLA, um, our aging division, they work uh, on it. We work with them together on this issue. It's, it's critically important. Um, but it's not just those things either. Um, and we've talked about this a little bit. Uh, there are other service providers, everything from taxis, um, things like in, in our mountain communities, Gilpin Connect, uh, volunteer drivers. You know, a lot of these agencies have volunteer driver programs, um, Uber and Lyft, even friends and family. Um, Steve Cook likes to go give people rides. So, you know, we don't think of that as a, as a, as a sort of um, always known part of our transportation solution, but those things are out there. Meals on Wheels, um, you know, senior-oriented church groups, you know, all of those things are out there and are critically important in this arena of public transportation, public and private uh, transportation. Uh, we look at funding. We look at both uh, funding by sort of service type, what's being funded. Uh, we look at the source of those dollars. And we, you know, critically important uh, for us in our aging group is looking at blending and leveraging funding. As Jayla would also tell you, there just isn't nearly enough funding. And you all know this in your own communities for anything we work on. But in the, in the transit realm, there just really is not enough funding. And so one of, one of it's, it's easy to say and really hard to do, but one of the sort of key things that we try to do is the blending and leveraging of funding sources to maximize every single dollar that we can to use it most efficiently. And that is an underlying critical theme in our transit plan. So there will be a quiz on this at the end of the meeting, so please study up. Okay, there won't. Um, this chart, um, and frankly, this is a simplified version, but it's meant to illustrate, yeah, that's, it's true. It's meant to illustrate the complexity of how transit is funded in this country, um, you know, in, in the United States and in Colorado, because there's many players, CDOT, FTA, other federal agencies, um, of how that kind of money, you know, flows down to the local level, where it comes from. You know, lots of players out there. It's really complex. Um, and again, one of the key themes is to try and, and you know, blend these and leverage these together uh, to do the best we can with what we have. 
but a few notable funding sources, obviously the Federal Transit Administration, they have what are known as formula grants, which are set amount, you know, based on your population or based on whatever statistic, you get this much money. And then they have discretionary grants, uh, which are, you know, competitive. You know, you compete for, uh, for funding for, uh, for that particular funding source. So they have both. Um, those uh, are administered by, depending on the grant program, either by CDOT or here by RTD. Um, CDOT has the faster, we all know about faster, I think, uh, faster safety, but there's also faster transit, which has two pools for statewide transit projects and local pools. Um, RTD sales and use tax, which is their primary funding engine, um, both for the base system and for fast tracks. Fairbox revenue, other local dollars, advertising, um, contributions, you know, there's, there's a long list. Um, we here at Dr. Cog, we have a few that we control that, you know, funding sources that can be spent um, on transit as well as other things. CMAC, which I think you all know is one of those sources, uh, congestion mitigation, air quality, so we can spend those dollars um, on transit. Uh, we can spend uh, what are known as STP Metro dollars uh, on transit as well. So just kind of quickly, uh, demographics and forecasted growth. Um, you know, just as in the larger transportation plan, we're looking at what does the future look like in our crystal ball that keeps changing. Um, so we look at individuals with disabilities. You know, we look at older adults and the youth. We look at low income and minority. We look at refugees. You know, we have a refugee program here at Dr. Cog, and those folks do many things, but one of those things is to work hard to connect refugees to uh, transportation to help them get where they need to go. Uh, folks with limited English proficiency. Um, so sort of these market segments in a sense of, you know, what is, our, what is our potential audience for people who might need or want to use transit service? And there's some overlap between them. You know, I could be a disabled veteran, for example. I could be a disabled minority veteran, right? Um, but, you know, we're trying to look at these groups that have a high propensity towards transit use. We're also looking at zero vehicle households. Um, some are by choice, some aren't, but those, again, are a transit market. So um, you've heard Jayla say this, you've heard us say this, um, you know this, the 60 plus population will be one in four by 2040. So look around the room, a fourth of us by 2040 uh, will be 60 or older. I, I think so, that's already the case. <laughs> Jayla says sooner than that. <laughs> so it's, it's, coming, it's coming even, even, uh, even more quickly. <laughs> So here's another one. I talked about 60 plus, but our 75 plus population will have a 200% increase. You know, we're living longer, which is good, um, but there's more of us who are living longer. How do we, how do we plan transportation? How do we help those folks? Um, so that's something that we're really interested in. And, and I've done a screenshot here of our Boomer Bond program um, that, is a, that is a toolkit of strategies uh, and ideas and things that local communities can do. And several local communities, many of yours, are actually participating in our Boomer Bond program. And I want to give Brad credit for that because he's, he's heading that up uh, to help communities uh, adapt and, and strategies that can help older adults and the general population. Um, needs assessment. So again, what are our needs for transit in the future? We look at several sources. Um, so again, to, to Director Cernanik's point, you know, public and stakeholder forums, um, providers, you know, talking to the transit providers, um, public surveys, um, needs assessments that have been done by others throughout the region. We're kind of putting those all together and saying, what do those tell us about the needs for transit in the future? Um, so none of these are, are, you know, potentially surprises, but, you know, sort of an affirmation that these are kind of our critical needs. Ongoing capital and operating dollars, we always need more of that, whether it's, you know, RTD with the bus system, fast tracks, or human service transportation. We just need to get more money out there um, to, you know, get more service out there uh, to help people get where they need to go. Um, we need more cross-jurisdictional trips and trip coordination. You know, this is an issue that Jayla and we and others, all of you work on. You know, I live in one county. I want to go to another county, you know, but there's this artificial border in between. You know, how, how do I bridge that gap? Um, how do we reduce other service gaps, whether it's geographic, whether it's time of day, whether it's, you know, type of service, whatever it is, how do we, how do we reduce those gaps that are out there? How do we improve accessibility to transit, whether that's literally accessing, accessing the transit stop, you know, there's not a sidewalk, maybe it's an information piece, you know, the bus comes near my house, uh, but I didn't know that. You know, I moved recently to the suburbs, I don't have a car, um, but I found out, hey, there's a call and ride, and I can use the call and ride. So connecting people to information, um, but literally helping them uh, get to transit. Um, so I kind of said this, coordinating services, coordinating between providers, coordinating across jurisdictions, uh, removing all types of barriers to access those services. <clears throat> 
Um, as I said, this is our integrated transit plan, so going back to kind of our MVRTP hat, um, our 2040 MVRTP fiscally constrained transit system. So this was in the plan that, that the board adopted in 2015. What can we afford through 2040? Uh, this map, as it says on the slide, shows our rapid transit projects, so our fast track system. Um, and then there's other transit services that are funded by category. So whether it's local bus, human service transportation, whatever it is, you know, we show dollar amounts for those in the fiscally constrained transportation plan. But, you know, Metro Vision, you know, the second word there is vision. We also have an envisioned rapid transit system that goes beyond our fiscally constrained and tries to think ahead of, you know, well, what else is out there? A lot of folks have done studies, whether it's RTDs, uh, Northwest Area Mobility Study, whether it's CDOTs, high-speed rail, inner-city rail studies, you know, studies that you all have done in your communities. We're trying to collect sort of that vision and piece it together uh, into one sort of regional uh, integrated uh, vision piece for uh, transit in the future. Um, you know, going back to who have we been working with on the transit plan uh, and who have we shown this plan to, um, you know, Matthew in particular and Dr. Cog's staff, we uh, have given presentations to our Transportation Advisory Committee, um, our RTC Committee, Advisory Committee on Aging, uh, a couple other committees, Dr. Mack that I mentioned. Um, so we're sort of doing the circuit, trotting this out, um, of, of showing this to several stakeholders and getting their input. So some of the major topics that have bubbled up from uh, from the work that we've done so far on sharing this draft plan. People are obviously interested in accessibility, as I mentioned, affordability of transit service, the issue of aging in place and maintaining independence, and what's the role of transit and transportation and being able to do that. Uh, transportation to healthcare obviously is critical. Uh, quality of life trips, you know, I don't just need to get to my doctor, but, you know, I want to get a haircut or I want to go out to eat, you know, how can I do that? Um, and veterans, you know, veterans is a very specialized, you know, they have a unique set of issues and challenges uh, we and others have been working with veterans to address their specific transportation needs. So I'm finally done talking. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Again, this is an initial conversation. You'll see me in the months ahead talking about other elements of our MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. Thank you for your time, and I'd be glad to answer questions. Director Jones. So if we have specific suggestions on different pieces of the plan, should we just email them to you? Or what's – I'm interested in the process, and then I'm happy to share some some yeah. thoughts here tonight too, but I don't want to get caught into minutia. And actually I'm glad you asked that question because I, I meant to mention that. So if there are specific things that you'd like to see or questions that you have that don't necessarily be, need to be heard by the entire group, yes, please email them to staff. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So just a couple though, I do think that you mentioned it, there's an ongoing need for revenues. I think we're experiencing that um, acutely right now as RTD goes through yet another shortfall in funding. And so hopefully this plan can, we can spend some time brainstorming about what is to be done about that, yeah. um, rather than just noting that RTD is a source of funds sometimes, but really do some work there. And I would also note on the map that you showed up of transit routes, um, there is a lot of opportunity that for adding arterial bus rapid transit on that map to connect, to connect the spokes coming out of the central region um, that I don't see reflected. I'm thinking in particular the, the Northwest Area Mobility Study adopted um, six potential arterial BRT recommendations that all of the, the communities along the Northwest Corridor unanimously agreed to. So. Um, and there's probably other B arterial BRT components that should be added based on the, the region-wide study that I think BRT, uh, RTD was funded to do. So I just want to flag that as well. Yeah, and, and just to say, Director Jones, the, it's a little hard to see, but the green kind of here in, in your area, uh, those are the NAMS uh, BRT corridors. <laughs> we, we tried to hide them from you, but they are there. <laughs> Mr. X. Thank you very much. Uh, Director Jones, no, thank you for your comments, and you are correct. I mean, as you know, um, RTD is also going to be undertaking a uh, regional a bus rapid transit study beginning in 2017. Unfortunately, the timing is not great for, for this plan update, but of course that's why we do it every four years. And we will make sure we'll, that this board is actively involved in that study when it, when it does take place, um, and I'm sure RTD will be would welcome your input anyway, but uh, we'll make sure you guys are actively involved. Yep. Director. Can I ask you what the study involves? This is Sally Daigle from Sheridan. The BRT study? 
Yes, the RDD study, what does it involve? What does that mean? Um, well, they'll be exploring, um, they'll be looking at, they'll, they'll be trying to identify corridors that are ripe for that type of technology, that being bus rapid transit. Um, so they'll be doing a comprehensive review of all the, all the major corridors within, our, in, within the entire region and um, coming up with recommendations on possibility, you know, possible corridors, what the cost might be for, for um, um, you know, development of that infrastructure in those corridors, that, that, that types of thing. I don't, I don't believe the scope has been fully developed, or at least I haven't seen it, but that, that, uh, you know, that is the intent. Director Sardanic? Yes, and I don't know if anyone else wants to chime in on some of this. Uh, I know at least uh, in uh, an aspect of what's happening in the healthcare field has been um, remote monitoring as well as telemedicine uh, that has the possibility of decreasing visits and some of that uh, technology dealing with uh, three-dimensional transmissions um, so that folks may not have to make those. Now, um, um, many of us boomers may be grounded in face-to-face, -face, but I do know that there's a generational shift, and um, you know, folks that have smartphones right now just recognize that 22 years ago, uh, most of us were probably still dealing with dial-up and how our world has changed uh, in 22 years, uh, and we're roughly talking about uh, that kind of shift. Um, so do you want to comment on it? And I don't know whether anyone else wants to uh, talk about some of those uh, discontinuities that might occur. Hmm. Well, Mr. I'll Shamanic, this is Sam Lee, Bagel. What, what disconnects are you, do you have in mind? Uh, particularly, I know, that I, I know in the, uh, uh, when you start to deal with both industry uh, as well as health care uh, being provided. Uh, some of these you know, may not require as much face-to-face -face interaction to actually be as productive or meaningful uh, in that, and that uh, you know, as, as we age, I mean, the uh, uh, Advisory Committee on Aging has seen some technology that allows for remote monitoring uh, that's really kind of scary in 1984-ish ways. Uh, that some of us may remember. And uh, since we brought up music, I'll bring up an author, George Orwell, and some of his uh, his uh, um, prognostications that didn't necessarily occur in the year that he had projected. But uh, it's certainly some of that is out there. Uh, that some of these might actually have, um, you know, a place where right now you have a green room that has uh, a background. You may have a green room that it's actually all green. Uh, dealing with three-dimensional activity. I, I think uh, some of us may have experienced um, some of the 3D transmissions uh, that can occur over phones right now uh, to allow space-to-space uh, -space communication. Yeah. I think that we have a contribution from Ms. Sanchez. <laughs> so I hope that happens, right? Because we're already having a crisis when it comes to senior transportation and getting people to the doctors. There's a lot of payment um, systems that are going to incentivize this. So Medicare and Medicaid will start incentivizing these kinds of programs. Uh, what we're trying to do here at Dr. Cog is really work much more collaboratively than we ever have. I've worked here a very long time, and I can tell you I've never been so um, I, I just every time he says aging or something, I, I'm just so happy because, you know, five years ago it was not like that um, here at Dr. Cog. Aging has been integrated into um, what we're doing, and Doug and I have been working collaboratively, thinking about what the future of transportation looks like for our senior population, uh, autonomous vehicles. But all of these factors, the world is just changing so fast right now, and it's hard to predict what's going to happen. Um, you know, I've been talking to our modelers about modeling transportation uh, of seniors. Seniors drive at different times. Um, I know Atlanta is doing that at the COG there. So there are, there are, I think, a lot of things that we will have to factor in. Uh, uh, this is just m m one of those many things that are changing. And it's, I, I, it's, I think it's hard to be a planner right now. <laughs> but exciting. Yeah. Sally Sorry. here again. Back to Mr. Cernanek's, um discussion about the telemedics. 
actually in rural areas they're using telemedics um, uh, and they have been for some time. They're able already to um, monitor uh, remodulin pumps over the um, phones. They're able to um, do uh, pacemakers and set and reset them or speed them up or slow them down over the phone. Um, and um, using computers and what have you, they're, they're able to actually do doctor visits with patients in rural areas. Um, they may not be able to put hands on and what have you, but they're able to check in with their patient. They're able to see remotely if they're doing their blood sugars correctly and what have you. Um, so uh, being able to do a 3D um, remote scan probably isn't that far-fetched and um, it, it is the, it's the future. But telemedics have been happening for some time now, probably for the last maybe 10 years, and which is a good thing because it's so very hard to get physicians um, into those rural areas where, uh, you know, the, the pay is not as good. Um, so it, it's probably a really good thing. Now, the question is when those patients do need to get into the um, city for an actual checkup or uh, a procedure or whatever, that's where you're going to have to have some, um, uh, you know, discussions around how does uh, transportation make sure that those things happen? Because um, there, seniors do drive at different times. Seniors make appointments later in the day. They make them, you know, after they've gotten up and had their coffee and had their, you know, done their morning uh, chores and what have you. And um, you're gonna, we're going to have to consider the elderly population does things a, a little bit differently. Um, and for good reason, you know, number one, they're, they're concerned about their safety and number two, they move a little slower. So director Teal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, another piece that I, I think, uh, I'm seeing missing from the brief that I think we should uh, include, uh, involves economic development considerations. Uh, just through the fact that when we did go through Metro vision, um, we did have that session where we brought in, uh, some of our economic development, uh, you know, experts from around the metro area. And that's just the kind of the thing that I'm not seeing here. So I, I would like to see that. Okay. I think we all get in, we've all been invited to site selector meetings. So what are the site selectors telling us about the region? But then on bringing it down, what are the individual uh, EDCs that float around the region? What are their priorities? Perhaps we should integrate that into our planning priorities as well. All right, good conversation. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Rieger. Good presentation. Thank you. And um, again, if you have some specific, specific items that you would like staff to address or incorporate, please uh, get them to them. So next we have agenda item six, which is attachment C, and uh, it's a very light topic of UGA, UGB. <laughs> Mr. Calvert. Thank you for that setup. If Jacob was nervous about sort of this feeling complicated, um, given the conversations you've had previously, I am petrified uh, because we have not necessarily as a board, you as a board, have not really talked about this topic a lot um, over the last uh, few years. So uh, bear with me if, if you don't mind. I'll pull up the presentation. Just a quick uh, presentation, and then obviously we've got time for discussion. Uh, there are really kind of two discussion items that we put in the memo for you this evening. Um, one feels a little more technical and one feels a little bit more policy oriented and we'll talk about a little bit those um, in, in detail. Uh, I would love to do a very scientific poll here. Uh, uh, raise your hand if you consider yourself an expert on the Denver region's UGB program. We got one in the back, which is good. Um, I, I was hoping that because that is my phone or friend, uh, so that's good. Uh, so maybe a lower bar. Um, back in 2013, the board uh, voted to delay um, this process to really after MetroVision was adopted. Very brief conversation. Who was on the board in 2013? Okay, so like alternate, okay. 
What about the sort of late 2000s? That was really the last time the board spent a lot of time on this issue. Anyone that was on the board, 06, 07, 08, that's kind of what I, what I thought. Um, yes, well, uh, some of you kind of come and go um, in different positions, so there is the chance that that can happen. Uh, so, for instance, I think Nancy Sharp has, was, was involved um, during um, that time frame. Uh, but really, that's my way of sort of under, you know, laying out in front of you. There's a very steep learning curve with, curve with this topic. Um, I guess my advice to you is um, I think we can do a pretty good job as staff compartmentalizing some of the discussions, but my, my nervousness comes with you losing the big picture. Uh, so please, if that happens over not only today, tonight's discussion, but in the future, let's hit the pause button and let's make sure people can sort of wrap their head um, around that, that big picture. Uh, I will also offer um, on this topic, we've, um, last year and even into this year, uh, we've done some very uh, specific orientations with either individual board members or even groups of board members. So if that really would be helpful for you, reach out to me and, and me and my staff will come out and sort of spend some time with you specifically uh, to kind of orient you to what can be a, a pretty complicated uh, topic. So I want to interject something real quick, and that is that since this is a pretty complex topic and we haven't addressed it, Mayor Rakowski is the only one that raised his hand that was here in 2006. Um, I would suggest if you look around the room and see people, colleagues that you that aren't here, that we reach out to them, encourage them to attend these work sessions, because this is where we're going to get the real education on what this is, rather than having to, you know, take this dive on it and then take another bite at the apple later on. So let's let's please commit, if you would, that. We're going to reach out to some of our colleagues and in, encourage them to be here for these conversations. Director Kadich. Real quick, thank you, much, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to clarify, since um, we did have a presentation on this at the retreat, I see a lot of retreat faces, maybe not all, but pretty strong. Um, I was just curious, is this the same information or a little bit of same and a little bit of picking up where we left off and kind of what we had suggested we thought might I be. I have right. a very abridged version of the workshop version and then really kind of a, the, the discussion that's in front of you tonight is new. The continuing, yeah. great. That's just helpful as we orient our brains. <laughs> uh, so actually, very perfect segue. So I am going to fly through these slides because they were uh, presented at the workshop in a, in a longer format. We also linked uh, to these to that pres that workshop presentation um, in the memo, but I wanted to give some historical perspective on Dr. Cog and the Denver Region's Urban Growth Boundary Urban Growth Area Program. Uh, in many ways, it is a response to some conversations in the mid '90s about not just in the Denver Region but around the country about really explosive growth um, in um, in uh, developed uh, urban areas. Sort of the the image that always comes to mind is this National Geographic article from the mid-90s, and I always like to read the quote, like, blots in a geographic Rorschach test, front-range cities ooze toward one another, right? This was the image of not just the Denver region, but other urban regions around the country. Um, you know, this article came out in 1996. The board had actually started conversations on this topic even before this. So in some ways, they were a little bit late to the party. Um, the, the, the directors at the time were already spending time on this issue to how to um, feel um, a little bit more like we were collectively managing growth um, in our region. And we were, the thought was to do this for any number of reasons, that that amount of growth um, really was ultimately going to potentially have negative effects um, on the region that we, we call home, whether that's traffic congestion, air quality issues, uh, water supply, all those things were ultimately going to be impacted by not only the magnitude of, of growth, but even potentially uh, where that growth was occurring uh, around the region. Uh, in addition to that, really one of the things that's the hallmark of the program, which and it is unique, um, we are we are to our in our minds really the only region um, in the country that that approaches this issue um, in the way that we do through sort of this voluntary uh, bottoms up approach. But the other reason that that really the board kind of landed on this as a as a key strategy uh, back in the mid and late 90s was this idea of let's build better awareness of, of local growth plans and priorities. Let's understand where each other, where our neighbors are actually planning to, to put urban growth and urban infrastructure in the future so that we can all feel uh, informed both community to community, but also as, as Dr. Cog, as the regional planning organization, thinks about um, regional growth, growth assumptions, they should obviously be informed uh, by local growth assumptions uh, as well. Uh, so 
starting with even the very first MetroVision plan, MetroVision 2020, which was adopted in 1997, our region for 20 years has had what we sort of boil down to a very simplified kind of growth strategy. One is sort of managing our urban footprint to kind of understand as a region how we're going to grow, where we're going to grow. That's urban growth boundary. And the other one is sort of the urban intensification side of things, urban centers, right? As we manage growth um, uh, growing out potentially, are there places in the region that want to step up and say, we want that additional population and employment growth, and we want it to happen um, in more compact and mixed-use places that are served by a multimodal uh, transportation uh, system? So that's really kind of how we balance those two. Is, again, a very oversimplified uh, version of our, uh, of our region's growth strategy. So really kind of the overall purpose and origin of the UGB kind of comes down to these three things. And to avoid putting 40 words on, on the slide, I think maybe the way to do this is to really just sort of, I think these are fragments of a sentence that I will kind of fill out. Um, so, you know, the UGB is there to maintain and improve quality of life in the face of continuing growth, right? Recognizing that we're a growing region, we, we just need to come to terms with that and do it in a way that's best uh, for our region. Um, to understand those 20-year growth aspirations at the local level so that they can roll up um, to a regional understanding of how the region wants to grow, and then to maintain local control um, in the face of that growth, particularly in absence of straight state growth management legislation. In the 80s and 90s, there was a proliferation of state growth management um, legislation in other states around the country, but that's not really how Colorado wanted to approach it. In our region in particular, we wanted to keep that element of local control and to really sort of think about our way that we wanted to grow um, as a region, and, and the UGB is in many ways a construct um, that came out of that, that conversation. So as I mentioned at the workshop, you know, we've kind of been rolling with this, this metaphor to help people understand kind of the roles that are associated with the UGB program. You, the directors, the board, are mostly involved with kind of the, the, what we call the budgeting piece. Um, you really are sort of set that overall policy for both your, for members, including um, your um, technical and planning staff, as well as for staff here at Dr. Cog. You also have a role in allocating or awarding UGB to communities uh, around the region. Um, your individual uh, local governments at home, you really are the owner of that UGB, right? There was a lot of discretion and flexibility that comes with where you locate that UGB, um, when you decide to commit UGB. Really, what we ask as, as staff is simply to keep us informed. Um, and that's really kind of where that, that, that accountant role um, comes in for Dr. Cog's staff. We, we, we track changes over time of, as to who may own uh, UGB through annexation, and then obviously we, we try to understand how those UGB commitments ultimately in, impact the growth as assumptions associated um, with the region. Director Atchison. Yeah, this, this is one of the things that we talked about at the retreat, and we continue to bring up that the necessity of all of us, whether it's county or municipality, and having our planning departments keep up with our growth management plans at whatever level they are to make sure they are constantly updated and that information is transmitted to Dr. Cog because that's the one group that collects it from everybody that puts it on a, a general geographic map for the metro area, not individually. So I continue to harp on this as it's the data in is only as good as the data that we're going to get put out. And if we don't update, then when the time comes to make those allocations, we're going to be doing it on false data. Uh, so Jacob mentioned in his presentation that he had a slide that he thought was the hardest slide to get through in the presentation. This is mine. Uh, the concept is actually not that hard, but I just want to be very clear, I am making a transition right now. Previously, we were talking about urban growth boundary. Think about that's the future. Right, but as the accountant, we are also interested in the current. And so that's really, I'm making that transition now, and I just think that's important to, to understand. One of the things that we do as Dr. Cog, and we obviously work with your staff to do this as well, is to really kind of understand what's, what's currently urban. Um, and we, there's a whole set of rules that are actually board adopted that instruct us as Dr. Cog staff how to go through that process. And that's one of the things that we are going to kind of pick up uh, and discuss uh, this evening. And so when we go through that process, you know, we, we classify each and every parcel in this region as urban, semi-urban, semi-rural. There's other way, um, sort of classifications. And I think people hear the word urban and something comes to mind that maybe feels more like the CBD. Um, as previous boards were discussing uh, and beginning to sort of implement this program, I mean, it's a very simplified approach as to what's urban. Um, it's, you know, whether it's the CBD to Ken Carroll, 
to Highlands Ranch, all these areas are classified as urban, right? Really, it's, it's the easiest threshold to think about is um, residential lots that average less than an acre. I mean, that, that's a lot of, of our region. In fact, every single jurisdiction in our region has some land under this program that's classified as urban. So don't hear the word urban and sort of tune it out and says that doesn't apply to my, our community. It really is something that through the process um, was designed to be uh, a way of thinking that really applied uh, to everyone because these areas still require some level of urban uh, services. So just to kind of give you a mental image of really what gets classified uh, as urban through that, again, accounting process to identify what's urban today. So uh, the memo really, as I mentioned, points out um, a couple of things that we want to kind of um, uh, discuss with you this evening. For those that were at the workshop, um, I think you all made a really good request, which was, you know, you know you're, you're going to pick up the policy conversation, but tell us about kind of where we stand today, this existing extent of urban development. And the memo kind of lays out some things, and I'll talk about it in, in a little bit. Uh, the short version is we can't walk in here today and give you a number that we're confident in. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that and really kind of make a suggestion that, frankly, staff go away and work on that for a little bit and come back to you with maybe a proposal um, that helps um, streamline uh, and sort of make that process a little bit uh, more transparent. Um, you know, we have really sophisticated com computer, computer models, um, ever uh, improving local data, and some of this is simply taking that reality of where we are in the world in 2016 and trying to make sure it lines up with 2009 direction that came from the board and really actually running that direction by you to see if that still makes sense. Um, and so we'll talk about that um, here uh, for a few minutes. Uh, to give you a few examples of sort of some of the technical things that we are dealing with, just to kind of give you a sense, um, where we see some things that you know, I think the word that's used in the memo, which is kind of right, is sort of this is an incongruency between what we think the intent of the program is and what we are, the, the instructions that we're following um, in, that, in those board adopted guidelines. Uh, so uh, those guidelines really focus on residential lot size, um, but we have lots of development in the region that are multiple units on single lots. So you, you're seeing an um, image on the slide now that's a uh, manu manufactured home uh, park. Uh, a 50-acre parcel with, you know, well over 300 units on it. The way that the, we're, we, the rules that we follow would instruct us to not classify that as urban. And that just doesn't feel like that's consistent when really you're looking at 7 DU per acre on this, you know, probably something we need to think about and come up with, uh, with a technical fix um, that really kind of aligns intent with really how the model works. Again, we can make the model do a lot of really cool things, but it's sort of that upstream stuff that we got to make sure um, and get right. So not an uncommon thing for uh, manufactured um, home parks as well as apartment complexes to be on single parcels, unlike standard single family home subdivisions that are obviously going to go through the subdivision process. Um, we also struggle, the model struggles in particular with, with open space and how open space um, is thought of, particularly in developed areas. It's actually pretty difficult. So what you're looking at here is sort of Sloan, the Sloan's Lake area in Denver, sort of the way people think of Sloan's Lake Park, that's four parcels. Some of them are, are in a subdivision, some are not, and both parcels and subdivisions in, in some ways are the data building blocks uh, for this process. Um, and so you end up with some of, the, some of the park that's classified as urban and some of that's classified as, as open space or, or another use, right? So let's think about how we can be consistent about how we treat um, uh, issues like this. Uh, open space, just kind of an, another slide, with maybe without an image. This is actually something that came up during the MetroVision conversation when we were talking about sort of open space and green space issues. There was a question, and I can't remember who it came from, about sort of for Dr. Cog's open space inventory, you know, how do we, what process do we use to classify things as open space? And really what happens is we take the local classification method and simply try to roll it up regional, regionally, right? So, and open space and classifying something as open space is the very first step in the model that we run, right? So what ultimately that open space inventory is really important. The two easy ones to throw out there, some folks count golf courses, some folks count cemeteries as open space, some local communities don't, right? And we aren't going to be necessarily in the business to say you should count it or not count it. We do very little to sort of um, uh, fool with kind of the classification system that kind of comes with us. So maybe we need to think about um, sort of a more standard approach. Um, another thing that, we, that the model looks for are um, areas where there are concentrations of employment um, and, and, and seeks to classify those as urban, but the words on the page specifically say commercial or industrial uses. 
and we have other land use types that have concentrations of employment that, that to me would be not those things. Um, civic functions in particular, whether it's schools and municipal buildings are sort of um, a, a primary culprit here where you are likely to have in excess, well in excess likely, of about 50 employees at this, at this pretty large uh, school facility. So, you know, we, you know, do we need to think about either the, the, the model and technical approach or do we need to think about the intent here and suggest that other uses that have more than 50 employees um, ought to be considered in this uh, process as well? Um, another one that, you know, there aren't a lot of them, but uh, ultimately we see pretty consistently difficulties with the model classifying land or airports. Um, airports do not typically go through sort of your typical subdivision uh, process, which again, that subdivision data is, in, is almost the very first thing that built this model builds from. So what you, what you see on the screen is um, Centennial Airport, over 100 parcels in 12 subdivisions, some parcels not in subdivisions. You probably can't see it on, on it probably gets washed out on your screen, but this is, this is the runway. Some it gets classified as open space, some gets classified as urban. We probably should be think of a universal way to treat airports. You know, we don't want to come up with a lot of exceptions, but for something like this where there aren't necessarily a lot of general aviation airports, maybe we think about how we treat airport operations um, within this process. Uh, so that's kind of some examples of that to me were the easiest to convey. There are some that get down a level that are that even I would probably struggle with standing up here trying to give you a good explanation. So um, a little bit about kind of what we're su suggesting and want to talk about this evening. Um, Wait, could the director Kanich, did you have a? Okay, thank you. Almost there. I'm, okay. You good? Well, I, um, director Cernan, I, I'll, I'll come in at this point in time because it may address some of this this issue. I know that um, as opposed to parcels, we've, we've done a mapping of, of our city using GIS. Um, I don't know how many other cities have or how many have not yet adopted a GIS mapping and whether that would be something to consider other than using parcels as the base. Sure, and so, I mean, and, you know, we use parcels because most folks have um, parcels in GIS, and so that allows us to ultimately do uh, that analysis. Um, really the thing, for instance, so I mentioned earlier that the thing that really we're struggling with is we actually have much be better data now. In 2005, we pretty much had parcels for everybody. What we didn't necessarily have is the best sort of counts of, of population and employment by parcel type. Right, so there's, there's much more sophisticated analysis that we can do on top of those parcels that really would help us um, correctly uh, classify um, each parcel through, the, through this process. Um, the other thing that I would mention is, um, you know, I may have said it before, you know, we talk internally that one of the things we're struggling with in the modeling process is that we are, we are stretching our underlying data to the, probably beyond its intended purpose, right? If you're building a model that builds on underlying data, you want to actually design the underlying data to support the modeling function, right? We don't necessarily, we don't have that luxury at this point. I mean, assessors um, develop parcel layers, frankly, to figure out um, who to send tax bills to and for, and for what amount based on sort of all the, the uses, improvements, and, and that sort of thing. So we are stretching the intended purpose of that to try to do some additional analysis, and that's where some of the tricky stuff um, comes in. So. In terms of really what the conversation is that we're starting this evening and hope to carry forward um, for the next um, probably few months, if not longer, is to really kind of just make sure that there's alignment between sort of the, the high-level direction that we have with the board and the sort of operational and mechanics uh, part of this process. Uh, we actually, you actually as a board, kind of talked about this issue about a year ago. Um, in the MetroVision conversation, and at that time, you confirmed or reaffirmed the importance of, of, of thinking about managing our urban footprint as a region. But frankly, people around the table expressed frustrations with how the process actually works. So that's where we are in the process now. That's what we, what we want to do. We want to make sure uh, that the program itself is set up to, to ultimately deliver on what you think is important um, from the sort of the higher level uh, policy standpoint. This, which is really kind of what this slide is about. I've, I've said it a few times. Board was really involved in the late 2000s to get us to where we are today from sort of our policy guidebook. Um, we have better data. We have better tools. We have a whole new set of board members that, to me, now is the time to revisit and just make sure there's alignment so that we can go forth and ultimately deliver um, a program that works for all parties involved, board, uh, Dr. Cox staff, and local staff that are obviously doing a lot of the heavy lifting um, on this in well, as well, so that's kind of um, where we are. So um, last slide, 
you know, it really kind of gets to the two items that we're asking for some discussion on um, this evening. You know, we talked about this at the workshop, really kind of the stuff that we need to kind of calibrate at this, for this point in time, kind of fall into three buckets. Um, one is that underlying technical e exercise, how do we actually classify land as urban? Um, that's sort of the discussion one um, in the memo. Frankly, staff's suggestion is let us go work with, with your staff and kind of come back uh, with, with, with some suggestions. It feels way in the weeds. Um, the stuff that I gave you tonight is probably the easiest stuff to get. It will only get harder and denser um, after that. So if there's comfort with that, um, we, are, we are certainly um, comfortable in doing that. Um, it would probably take a couple of months because it would be an iterative process. Um, one of the things um, that if you deal with models, you understand is just because if you make one fix, it could mess up everything that happens before it and everything that happens after it. So it is very much this iterative process of making sure you have not gone backwards with something that felt like uh, was taking you forward. And that the way that it is set up right now, those rules are ultimately governed um, by board adopted policy. So that's kind of item one. Um, item two is really kind of these, these next two buckets. Really what we're asking is, you know, I think you made a good suggestion. Let's talk about where we are in terms of currently urban development before we begin the policy conversation. Unfortunately, we can't deliver that to you. So our question to you this evening is, are you comfortable beginning the conversation and apt and you know and absent that that data, which we will enter you know obviously bring to the conversation uh, as soon as it's available, or or do you want to sort of hold off and and see the data first and then begin uh, kind of these other conversations that are about sort of how the all allocation process works, how the, the overall maintenance works, how we work with um, you and your staff to make sure that the communication lines are open so that we can continue to sort of, again, uh, sort, of, sort of monitor um, what happens mechanically or operationally uh, with the UGB program. And that concludes my presentation. Happy to talk about it, answer questions, whatever the pleasure of the group is. Thank you very much. Um, I have Director Kniech and Atchison. and I did want to point out one thing first. Uh, Mr. Calvert, very nicely uh, laid out what the next steps are for our conversation. And I would only point out that directly behind attachment C on the second page, it, it gives a little more narrative detail of the items that staff is looking for guidance on. Um, guidance needed part one, guidance needed part two. And that's kind of distilled in that last slide as well. So just pointing that out. Director Kniech. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I wanted to go back to the slides you had on all the potential fixes. Sure. I think you're generally in the right direction with the exception of the employment one. Uh, 50 employees seems like maybe a high threshold. You might have a small number of employees, but a high number of traffic and a high number of customers. So I would, I would like you all to spend more time on the employment metric. It doesn't feel quite right to me yet. It, it, Yes, yeah, something, something that indicates more if this is a bustling active place or I, I don't know. And I also just am curious if there's any standard for that. Because, um, you know, again, if parcels are big, then the employee number will be very, dis you know, diffuse. And if the parcel's small, 50 is too high of a number. You know? So if you've got, a, if you've got an, eighth of a, an eighth of an acre, 50 is way too high of a number, you might need 20 or 30. So, so anyway, I think some more work on that. Um, on the overall stuff, I guess I just wanted to signal that I think this is the right direction. Um, and, and so my, 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 my hypothesis for folks to think about is that I think we, we can and maybe should do both at the same time, which is you all go back and start working on all these technical fixes while we have a conversation about process. Mm -hmm. What I don't want to do is be looking at maps or numbers until you're done with the data and it's solid and reliable. But I see no reason why we can't talk about what is what is good process look like, and you know what is good communication about that process look like. To me, that that should not depend on what the maps or the numbers look like. So, so I, it seems to me like to be efficient because you know we we have sometimes taken a long time to get to our deliverables here on the board, and sometimes that's been for very good reason that we've slowed things down. But there are folks who've been waiting for this conversation. So I would hate to say. No, let's not talk about anything. Two, to me, seem independent, right? One is get the numbers, the maps, and the data right. The other is what does the process look like? And, and so I, I think you're in the right direction, though, and I appreciate the feedback that you clearly took from our last conversation. So, Director Atchison. Yeah, Brad, I, I think one of the things I would ask you to consider, and this is on the 
open space designation. Um, since I have to split requests for open space funding for two counties, and at least within our city, we have a pretty common understanding that if it's called open space, it's not maintained. If it's golf courses, anything like that that's maintained, that's called undevelopable. It means that we're not planning to build anything on it, it's going to be maintained, whether it's a cemetery, a, a, a park, a golf course, whatever. And I think that was helping us, uh, at least in Westminster, for us to work with our county as we not only collect sales tax or for our own internal open space, but in getting a common understanding of them what is open space versus funding for parks and recs and other stuff. So I think that might be one place you look at, see if there's a commonality between the counties who typically provide that back to the municipalities. If we can get at least to that kind of a basis, that gives you a starting point that not there won't be as much argument or discussion about. Director Teal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Brad, one of the things that um, uh, I do recall from the briefing document that we received up at uh, uh, up at the retreat, <coughs> but I don't see it here, is um, also planning for, or I should taking into consideration what is planned for, as well as what is existing. Uh, just do the fact, you know, we've, we've got communities that are still in development, that are still growing, that have areas that are, you know, definitely planned for urban development. And then others that are not, that are planned to be parks, uh, but you know they're undeveloped until you get the money to actually put in a sidewalk. And I'll, I'll just add, I mean that that's another division of how to how to think about this um, this development classification system. That is what's on the ground today. What has come? What is vertical? What's been platted? What's known to happen? The broader UGB conversation is is just that. And so I mean, part of it is is again getting to the. The process and the mechanics that I sort of use the term lines of communication to make sure that really the region is aware of, of local aspirations and how we um, incorporate those aspirations into overall regional growth assumptions and so that the board can understand those collective impacts. So that's very much really what the program is intended to do. Yeah, because just to bring it back to the very beginning of the briefing tonight, you know, showing that graphic from National Geographic, well, that was what was planned not necessarily what had been built at the time. So, yeah, I, I think that would be uh, very important for us to make sure that we're – it's not just what's on the ground, but what is planned, what is zoned, et cetera. Director Rakowski. Uh, two items. Rappo County, as I think you're aware, has an open space tax. That tax generates a lot of money, and that money is fenced uh, by – an election that has taken place twice, the original and renewal, and so that can give you some very solid backgrounds. And then in our particular case, uh, our open space definition is in the charter. In the charter? Yes. Director Jones. So I, I guess I want to um, piggyback on what um, Director Kanich had brought up, I, I think what you're suggesting in terms of going back and talking with jurisdiction staff about the technical issues and sort of coming up with a working proposal on various ways to define things makes a whole lot of sense. But I guess we, we have just gone through, we're not done yet, and knock on wood, a very lengthy MetroVision update process that was off by at least a year in terms of how long we thought it was going to take. And I guess I would want us to um, think about the conversation that we're getting into with urban growth boundaries areas. Um, how long should we um, expect to have this conversation? And maybe we could do a little bit better job, perhaps with the, the executive committee's help, on policing ourselves to fit within the time frame that we agree we should allot to it. Because um, I am a little bit worried about us sprawling, oozing, if you will, for years on this. Um, and I think we have the capability of doing that if allowed to. So it could be that working concurrently at the board level and the staff level is a way to go. But I just think we should sort of map that out and maybe have the executive committee come back and say, hey, let's, let's plan it for this time frame and see if we can stick to it a little bit better than we did for MetroVision. Maybe we can get our board chair to, to, to champion that. 
<laughs> this, this year current or the future one? Touche. Current and future. Yeah. <laughs> Director Stolzman. Thank you. I'm supportive of staff uh, working with our local jurisdictions to correct the model. I think that's the way to go. Uh, there have been some comments made that left me, maybe I don't understand, but I didn't think, uh, Mr. Calvert, that you cared about ownership of the property, whether it was public or privately owned. If it wasn't urban developed by your set of standards, you were considering it open, not open space, like some people are talking about, but open. So it. I didn't understand some of the people's comments. I guess I didn't think that was consistent with what you were trying to map. You were trying to map what was actually on the ground and developed as urban. Correct, but also, but also understand that, that to get to urban, we have to, we have to classify land in other ways, right? And one of those is open space. And so that's really where open space comes in uh, because, as I mentioned, it's the first rule Right, so if it's open space, it comes off the books and cannot be urban. So that so getting that one right, in particular, ownership doesn't matter. You you're absolutely right on that. That doesn't matter. If it is, in the and in, in the perfect world, if it was, um, if it's protected open space that is not really expected to be developed in the in the near term, we would want to know that on the front end so that it does does not get misidentified as 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 something else. So with your definition of protected open space, in some cases a golf course might make sense as open space, and in some cases a golf course might not make sense as open space. Yes. So I think, I think working through all of those details at the staff level is perfectly appropriate. Um, and then I think it would make sense to start working through what our allocation request process is. But I do think some, you know, while people say they don't want to look at the numbers, I do think some general this is what it might be, this is what things might be like, some scenarios, and maybe not even use our region, but just like bubble charts or something, so people could understand some theoretical ideas of if the boundary is this, this is what a proposal could look like, so that it's not just all abstract. Yeah, I'll just add, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, we want to, ideally, obviously, we want to have, staff wants to have a concurrent conversation. Um, there are some things that are better to, like, hold off until that, that data is available. I don't think how the board would prefer to treat annexation and ownership of UGB is impacted by that. I think everybody would want to be on the same page about how annexation gets treated in this process, and we, we can have that conversation sooner and, and other conversations later that maybe maps, charts, knowing what you, what you have today and how that might inform your allocation request in the future will save those to closer to when that, that information is available. What other questions and comments do we have? Does that give you clear? Yeah, I will, I will say what I said in the first slide. I mean, if this is making your head swim, I would. I love the chair's suggestion of find, find a colleague, um, invite them to be here, but also if, if, if you want us to come sit with you and your staff to kind of walk you through this, um, we're happy to do it. Um, it's, there is a very steep learning curve here, and we're happy to do things outside of, obviously, our regular scheduled time uh, so that you feel as comfortable as possible and, and being an informed participant in these conversations. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Calvert. Anything else for the good of the cause? Seeing nothing, 537, we're adjourned.